Okay, hi everyone. Um, well, I don't know that this work is so much poetry, but uh, <laughs> a, it's, uh, I'm gonna talk about two, two papers. I think it was advertised, um, <clears throat> right, a, and the one title, but it will be two works that are very related to each other. One of them is Practical Accountability of Secret Processes, and this is joint work with uh, Jonathan Frankel, Sanur Park, and Daniel Shah, who were students at MIT at the time, and uh, with Daniel Weitzner, who is a law professor from uh, Georgetown, who spends half his time at MIT. So in fact, it's, it's, a, it's work about a, com it's a combination between law and, and uh, cryptography, and the cryptography is certainly not heavy. I think people, were, at least from the world of cryptography here, not necessarily from industry, are well familiar with all that, and in theory, you know, it's fairly clear what components you, you would put together in order to come up with a system that addresses the problem, which I'm gonna explain in a minute, but the issue is really to identify the problem, to identify that there are some aspects of this problem that lend themselves to uh, make a system which would not be extremely inefficient. In fact, that there are some features about this uh, problem that uh, lend itself to use some of the tricks that we know of. And then actually they uh, implemented it, you know, so they p took some libraries, nobody implemented anything new here, but they took some libraries for MPC, some SNARK library, uh, and uh, tested out the system. And the performance is actually quite good, so I'll explain the whole thing. I just wanna say up front that this is a paper that has, uh, in some sense, uh, more of a societal appeal because you choose a problem that's important for society and maybe in a sense it shows where zero knowledge can take you even beyond microcurrencies, um, micropayments, whatever you call them. It's not microcurrencies, right? It's cryptocurrencies and micropayments. <laughs> All right, but it's not a bad name actually, microcurrencies. We can invent something. And the second paper is public accountability versus secret law. So that sort of takes a, a different uh, look at a, at a related problem, and this is just work with Sanu Park. Okay, so uh, turns out that um, you know uh, people have, have, I'm sure have heard about something called FISA, which is the Foreign Intelligence uh, Surveillance Act. Uh, so there's a court that deals with uh, surveillance of foreign uh, nationals, uh, and this court processes over about twenty eight thousand has processed about twenty eight thousand warrant applications. Uh, which is a rate of nearly 1,000 uh, secret cases a year. So these are cases that we have no idea about. And then there was some, a lot of uh, noise came about this when the public uh, attention was turned into it. And that's actually what the second paper is about. What uh, the first paper is about, which is most of my talk, is that people have talked a lot about this foreign intelligence issue, but they haven't talked much except for recently when there was this debate about key escrow for surveillance, about the fact that there's a federal uh, docket, so this handles actually US citizens, that handles apparently tens of thousands of secret cases every year, and this is surveillance. So there are tens of thousands of requests for uh, getting uh, surveillance warrants, uh, you know, for your email, for your uh, social network information, uh, going to Amazon, to Facebook, and so forth, which we are not aware of, uh, but are being issued. And um, that's what the second paper is about. So it turns out that um, there was a lot of writing by a particular judge called Judge Smith from Texas, who f found out that there's a lot of problems with this system. And this, the main problem is the problem of accountability, but in several ways, and I'll explain what the problem is. And he has a whole bunch of papers, which are actually very easy to read, um, where, he, so he, he, where he, one of them is called, uh, how do you say this, Kudzu? in the courthouse, judgments made in the shade, gagged, sealed, and delivered. Uh, so he points out uh, three problems with this system. And the main problem is that nobody knows about these uh, orders um, essentially in perpetuity. So it's not only that re a request of surveillance is issued and, your de and uh, let's say is granted, but this is never really uh, released, not even temporarily, but also in the long term. And also, it's, so it's never uh, really um, scrutinized. So let's just review for very quickly what the system looks like, right? So it's, it's like what you would write down, but I'm writing it down. So there's a law enforcement agency, I don't know, the FBI. They go to a judge, a local judge, they ask for a warrant, a, and let's say he grants it. So he gives an order, then they go to, the, to, to Amazon or Facebook or whatever. They ask for the data. 
a, the company may challenge it. So the company may say, we don't want to give the data, so that's that error that goes back to the judge. But let's say they don't challenge it, or the, or the challenge gets rejected, then they give the data response. Now, all of this supposedly um, is supposed um, it's supposed to be done in secret, because obviously if everybody knew about it, then they would stop talking and sending emails and so forth. So that, that's obvious, right? So in order to make sure that that's the case, there are sort of two legalistic terms that uh, govern this. One is sealing a case, so this prevents the court record from becoming accessible to the general public. That's not true about general court records, but it is true about these surveillance requests. And the other thing is called a gag order. The difference is that that prevents also the company uh, and it, so everybody involved, you know, the judge, the, the law enforcement, the company uh, with the case uh, for mentioning it to others. So these are two different sort of rules that govern the fact that this will uh, remain secret. So what are the problems? So problem one that he identifies, this is from the uh, papers of this judge, which uh, Danny Weitzner, who's the lawyer on the team, is well, he's very familiar with this guy. And so it's, it's the first of all, he claims that uh, what happens is that even though in the law, these laws are only in effect uh, for a limited amount of time, so it's supposed to be expire after, let's say, three months. And if you don't want to expire three months, you can ask for an extension for six months, for nine months. You are, there is no such law that is in perpetuity. It's supposed to expire, and it says, explicitly when it should be expi should expire, but uh, effectively nobody ever issues an expiration. So the judge is supposed to sort of lift the gag order or the Secrecy Act, and they don't do it. So there's thousands and thousands of these cases that are never, a, they're, all, they're sealed forever. And what's the problem with that? So um, the problem is what they call, I guess in legalistic jargon, is that there's no appellate guidance. Uh, so the, the issue being is that apparently these laws, the only way that they are really questioned is that if there's an appeal process, and then the appeal process uh, this gets discussed in court, and then maybe goes to a higher court because somebody uh, you know wants to question what the lower court has decided, and this could go all the way to the Supreme Court. So that's the, really the only way that a, a law gets uh, or a, gets in some sense scrutinized and modified, and that never happens because. Who's going to appeal? You know, the law enforcement and the company, they don't want to risk an appeal. It's going to be to nobody's interest for this to go public. And uh, obviously, the only affected party that would want to appeal is the person that has been you know, surveilled. And uh, they are never given prior order or post order. They have no idea that this has ever happened, except if they go to court and based on this evidence, they might be uh, convicted, then they would have you know, reason to know about it. And the third problem is that the public or the Congress ha has really no idea about what the magnitude of the problem is. So there's nobody that knows how much of this is happening. Maybe we're all being surveillance all the time. There is really no record of this. So the only record that does exist, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, is that companies on their own accord, they come out and they say, let's say Facebook or something, or, um, or Google, they say, we've received these many requests this year, okay? So they have this six, every six months there's a report of this sort, but nobody can check it. And um, you don't know where it's coming from, you don't know what the geographic distribution of it is, you really have no data. And they can claim little, they can claim a lot, depending on whatever their interest is, you know, which I have no idea. So what he proposes, okay, so this is no cryptography still. So this is a proposal, it exists in these papers, he, and this is supposed to be like a revolutionary proposal. He proposal so there will be a cover sheet so a cover sheet which contains metadata, which says about, uh, that should be always made uh, public. So in other words, every time there's a surveillance act, there should be some cover sheet that says uh, maybe the date and maybe a few other uh, um, details about it, sort of to satisfy what he feels should be accountable. But the obvious tension there is privacy versus accountability. So the more you release on this cover sheet, you know, the more... Um, the less private it is, maybe you can imagine that there'll be some point where you know, it's going to be easy to reverse so someone can figure out that they're actually being surveilled. And you can imagine people just uh, going through these cover sheets with the sole goal to figure out where, the, where surveillance is taking place. So I think it's sort of obvious to everybody here is that if they knew about cryptography and if they believed in cryptography, and if cryptography was public, we can solve it. It's like, you know, it's the, these theorems that we've had for many, many years, in some sense, in, in theory, it's all solved. It's not clear why this is a problem for anyone. Um, so in fact, is this the case, okay? So what the contribution of this paper is, which is a system it appeared in Usenix, is essentially a publicly auditable system using modern crypto. So what do we mean? We mean, uh, actually blockchains, so because this, it, there's a question of timing and expiration and the fact that it cannot be modified after the fact. 
a, their zero-knowledge proofs, which are kind of obvious, because we want to prove something about these sealed cases which we don't want to reveal. And there's even multi-party protocols, and they come in for this question of um, reporting. So sort of you want to report in aggregate of what's happening. And in fact, not only how many cases, but how they are uh, geographically distributed, or maybe what kind of crime is, is being um, pursued, uh, things of that sort in aggregate over all the federal judges, let's say in the US, which is about 800 of them or something. Uh, but so the question is how to do it efficiently. So obviously 800, MPC, you know, this kind of, uh, you know, even though I, I claim it's practical, it's obviously not less practical than desired. Um, so that's it. So we've got all these, in some sense, uh, crypto coming together and commitment schemes because you want to sort of post things or uh, hide the, the data surveillance orders in a very, very strong way, right? You, because you, you also have to think about this. If we, are, if we are talking for real, which this whole workshop is about how to make this for real, it's going to be a very uh, tough climb to convince the court systems to do this for many reasons. One reason is that they don't trust, and they shouldn't really trust, uh, issues of great security to the fact that factoring is hard or easy, or even home, uh, lattice problems or whatever. But we do have perfect commitment schemes, so in some sense, privacy is not such a big issue. Um, so we could do that, but it's important what kind of encryption or commitment we are doing. Another thing is, which is something that we're not going to address in this talk, is how do you actually convince a conservative system like the court system, even if all the crypto is perfect, let's say everything was information theoretic, to actually do this. And uh, we, the scheme that we came up with, the system, it was presented by Judge Smith, and we'll see the conclusions at the end, to a committee of judges that, uh, that talks about these things, and they rejected it immediately. But, you know, there's lot, that's, that's typical. That's like being rejected in a conference, you know? It's so the first you reject, you know? You know, because you, it's really easy to say that everything's wrong with it, you know? In the following sense, they say, what about software bugs? You say, now at least, you know, we know we don't, re yes, we don't unseal, it's secret forever, but, you know, it works to some extent. And every new system has some problematics with it. Um, but, um, but at least they're talking about it. Okay, so essentially what the system does, it's gonna de demonstrate to the public that each participant performs its role properly and lawfully. So remember the participants were the lawmakers, sorry, they were the law enforcement agencies, the judges, the companies, and then there's some amorphic public. Uh, so you wanna see that everybody's sort of doing what they're supposed to do, and you also wanna make public aware of the extent of electronic surveillance. So this is this aggregate type of information. And so what's the threat model here? And again, you know, this is not the kind of cryptographic definitions that I'm used to, but it's certainly the crypt kind of the way to expose the uh, cryptographic uh, threat models to an, a, a bunch of uh, judges. So the threat model is that the judges are honest, but they're forgetful. So they will follow the protocol. They're not just going to advertise everything, but they forget. What does it mean forget? They don't, uh, they don't, uh, unseal things. Uh, the law enforcement agencies, they might be malicious. So this has actually been happened in the past, so they might uh, you know, want to fake it that they got a court order, or they might do surveillance without a court order, and, and things of that sort. Uh, the companies might be malicious, uh, so in other words, they could report things which are not accurate, uh, they, both to the law enforcement and also later in their reports where they claim one thing or another about how many surveillance act, uh, requests they got. And the public might be malicious as well. So the fact that the public can now scrutinize something is something that you should worry about. I think the one thing that is not captured by this threat model is that the company, no, the, is that the companies and the law enforcement might collude. I think that in practice is reasonable to worry about, but we can't handle it. Okay, so if the, if the companies want to, and, and the law enforcement want to, between the two of them, do something uh, together in order to re reveal that there's nothing you can do about this. All right, so what's the solution? The solution, again, this is also, I think for crypto, it's obvious, but let's just go through it, because I have 40 minutes. No, um, it just <laughs> because this is the system. And also, these are the slides of Jonathan Franco, and I have to uh, acknowledge him, uh, I changed the colors. And then uh, the other part of the talk is the slides of Sanu for this other paper, so you'll see. Okay, so we've got, yeah? Oh, I don't? Okay, what time is it? According to the program, 30 minutes. Ah, 30, very good, okay. So what time, uh, how far am I? Uh, you, are, uh, you have another 16 minutes. Ah, no, okay, this I can do. 
Okay, so this is the public, so this is the ledger. Okay, so this is the ledger where you can post things and once you post them, there's some, uh, you can't uh, take them out and you cannot change order. So that's like what we call blockchain. Then there are these three parties, which is the judge, the company, and the agency. Uh, by agency, I mean like the FBI, the law enforcement. They ask for a warrant, he gives them a court order. Uh, and at that point, what the judge does is he posts on the ledger some metadata and that's in the clear. Now what's the metadata? At least it should have the date you know, of expiration, when this thing is supposed to expire. Um, and uh, you might have other things from this cover sheet that uh, um, Smith uh, suggested. I don't know, but that's already up to the judicial system. Okay, then the obvious thing is uh, the judge uh, grants it, okay? And he says, yes, I'm allowing it. And that's uh, encrypted, so it's in a box. Then uh, the, co uh, the agency goes to the company and asks for data. And, uh, and let's assume that uh, and then it puts it on, it puts this event on the ledger that he asked for data, he gets it back. Ah, before that, sorry, what is this blue arrow? So the red means is an event of posting things. The blue is the zero knowledge. So here you wanna, you wanna make sure that what you've asked from the company is what the court is allowed. So you have one zero knowledge proof already. So that there's consistency between what you requested and what the court allowed you. Then there is uh, the act of actually getting the data and you wanna uh, post that. Okay, and again, you want a zero knowledge proof that says that it's consistent with what was requested and it's also consistent with what the court uh, allowed to request. And then I think the last thing is sort of just to seal everything. Is so um, uh, the agency wants to say, I got it, you know, this uh, thing that you've allowed me to request has been requested and received. Okay, so the, all these blue arrows are the sort of zero knowledge proofs that would go, which all of them, what are they? What type of proofs are they? They are essentially um, equality, right? Either equality of values or um, a, that there exists a request that this corresponds to, so it's sort of existential equality, so it's not that two things are equal to each other, but that let's say what you received might be one of many, um, and, that, uh, and then also, uh, I think those are the two, yeah, essentially. So the reason I'm so particular is because really the point of this whole thing is also building the system and one wants to talk about how difficult it was, yeah. How do you authenticate the, the data? Like how do you know that the company is giving correct data? Ah, that's a very good point, you don't know. So there is some basic, that's like an MPC, it's like entering your input. So that's a basic problem with this whole thing. How do you know that the, it's, it's doing it? How do you know that the, um, that there are actually companies and the law enforcement are putting this on the ledger? Also they might not do it, forget about the, the right data, they might not post it. So you don't, this is things that you assume that they are following the protocol uh, to this extent. So you're right, I mean, you could, you could be waiting to see that there's a post that they've actually asked for something and the content is incorrect. Um, but you can also make the company maybe commit to information regularly in the blockchain. I don't know, That's, uh, we, didn't, we didn't deal with that. It's sort of an assumption that the company is going to give it and you could think about uh, um, the idea of penalty. So let's say this is disputed, okay, later when it comes to court and somebody and people show that they followed the whole system and the guy's convicted, he says, but that's not what I said, it's not the email I said. Then, you know, and if it's discovered, you would have some sort of a penalty. The penalty would be serious enough. You know, in some sense, like a GDPR type thing, uh, you know. Or, okay, um, all right, so this is the whole system. So first of all, if the goal has been satisfied, well, um, you can sort of go one by one and it's fairly simple to see, it's kind of straightforward and uninteresting, is that, uh, you know, that will be the case. Uh, now, what about ensuring that the, uh, the public is aware of the extent of surveillance, okay? What about that case, that issue? So, um, as I said before, there's lots of uh, reports that come out uh, from, this is from Microsoft, from Google. What is this other one? Transparency. So these, all these companies say report on government and private party requests for, so they, they publish these reports every six months, as I said, in which they report it. Um, but, uh, yeah. So why are they reporting them? Are they reporting No, they're not. That's totally, it's totally voluntary. So they can also not report. They can also not report. They can report incorrectly. There's no, no, nobody, uh, 
it checks to see, you know, it might be even if, if all the federal courts know that there have been a thousand requests, you don't know if, how many went to Google, how many went to Amazon. The thing is, it gets imported independently. Nobody correlates between these things. There's no way, really, because there's no information to correlate against. So the obvious thing is there are these end courts, okay? And you could imagine that all of them are going to just do an MPC, right? They all tell each other uh, how many requests they got, for what kind of crime. They give all the statistics. Then there's an MPC. So I, I draw it as a circle, but this is an interactive protocol, obviously, and the result is posted somewhere or published in a, in a kind of a common article. Um, the thing is, as I said before, this N, big N, is fairly large. It's like 800. And no matter how you look at it, even though these are simple statements, uh, they can become more sophisticated. For example, you want to search the type of crime and so forth. It's, it's very inefficient. And here comes where I think is the one interesting issue here in t from a technical point of view. And that is that uh, it so happens that this particular court system in the US is very hierarchical. So there is these uh, uh, courts, you know, the, the sort of intermediary 12 courts, where the, you know, where the appeal courts, where these decisions of the lower courts can go to. And there's exactly 12 of them. One of them is in DC. And 12 is already not such a big number. OK, so if you wanted to do a multi-party protocol among 12, that's something that we can handle, even for more sophisticated queries. We also demonstrated, but I think that stands to reason that 800 versus 12 is quite a, a different story. So now the idea is that each court is sort of essentially uh, takes his orders, share, secret shares it among those 12 courts. OK, it's sort of an immediate idea. It just so happens that what is in reality exists already sort of superimposes on this technique, works well. So everybody does that. And now these guys engage in an MPC and the result. So that's it, you know? So the, 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 the realization that the court system actually is built this way naturally, and hierarchical MPC is such a good idea, you know, solves the problem. All right, so uh, then uh, uh, these uh, students did some testing. So they said, you know, the timing, information versus uh, judges in the, you know, where all the judges are, are working together, I think it was only up to 300 judges they could even handle. Um, actually, what is this? This actually doesn't make any sense to me, but there are two charts, okay, where you're comparing <laughs> what happens to uh, uh, many judges versus 12. Uh, Ah, yes, yes, it does make sense. So this other, uh, this other, uh, this other <laughs> graph um, is, uh, you can even go up to 1,000 judges, but you are scaling it by the fact that you only have 12 uh, appeal courts that are doing the interaction. So obviously, it's linear, and it does much better. Okay. I mean, yeah. this computation is not something that is done like, frequently. So why care about time? Why care about time? Uh, that's also a good question. Uh, but the, OK, ah, good point. So say all the judges were working together. You're saying, why not let them work together? Why do we need to have this hierarchical? Because the also issue with the judges is where the, the hierarchical. I'm just saying, why you No, if you don't care about time, then don't care about it. You know, go. Uh, no, I'm saying the time of MPC. Like you're, this, is, this graph is about, OK, if I had 300 judges, it takes 400 seconds to compute. I'm saying even if it took a day, it's fine, right? I mean, in terms of scalability. Yes. Um, I guess the issue, another issue that I didn't mention is that if you're thinking about a thousand judges working together, some of them might not participate uh, at the same time. So the question is whether everything is happening simultaneously or not. Online at the, Online same. At the same time. So the, at least classical MPCs, that's how they work, right? We're working in stages. You know, we have to know something about participating, not participating, and what the lags are. OK. Uh, OK, what's another thing that they measured? So that was for aggregation. Then there's for threshold. Why would threshold make sense? You might want to say uh, only that you know, a certain company had it more above and below a threshold. So it's obviously slower, but again, scale is much better in the hierarchical. Then we also implemented SNARKs for this whole, for the you know, for proof of knowledge, uh, for equality, and for this existential equality. You know, there is a, a, requ there is a, a judge court order that's consistent with uh, a request. And I, I guess uh, they measure the size of the message, okay, which governs sort of the size of the key, because the size of the key is sort of the size of the, circ you know, the circuit that you want to prove the, the, the zero knowledge statement on. Um, and uh, I think proof of the lowest one is the proof of knowledge. Uh, the idea that I'm interpreting graphs is really a testament to my evolution as a, as a scientist or my, what do you call it? When you go back in evolution? Um, anyway, um, what? Evolution. 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 
Devolution, okay. In any case, the second uh, graph is uh, equality, the third is existential equality, and then uh, sort of a, when it, it talked about existential equality, I don't know what the other three is. If somebody wants to know, I, I, I mean, I used to know, but I don't remember right now. Okay, and then key sizes. So there's a lot of sort of uh, uh, information here to support the fact that this is okay. You know, this is actually kind of reasonable. So if you remember the title, the title was Practical Something, System for Court Accountability, and you know, this is somewhat of a support that it's not impractical. And, and also taking into, into account the fact that we didn't actually write any software in purpose for this. It was really just, um, Right, it was just taking packages. You know, one of the packages was this BU package about average salary, which uh, run. You know, this BU package for average salary, we used it for this, except, you know, we need 12 courts. And that thing only works up to 10. So when you get to 11, bug. So that, that shows you, okay. <laughs> the amazing thing here is, so there's a system that works for 10, okay. However, it turns out that the courts are 12, okay. So five minutes, okay. So, I mean, you know, I think this whole community knows this much better than me, but you know, the, the, the step from the idea to an instantiation might change you know, if the boundary cases are different by one. You know, it kind of boggles your mind, but it's still true. You couldn't want that the whole system uh, would suffer from that. Uh, what was another statement about that? Um, right, so these things were off the shelf. I think it was Lipsnark that was used here for the zero knowledge uh, arguments. Uh, but the kind of statements were actually not um, artificial equality statements, but they had to do something with the court system. So sort of uh, both Jonathan, who was, used to be a law student, has a law degree, and, and Danny Weitzner sort of looked at the type of statements that want to be shown and wrote down the sort of circuits for it and, and, and implemented it. So this is not far, so far removed from the, with, from the real system. I think the real question is, what do the judges think about this? So going back to Smith, okay, he said uh, he, he uh, of course, he's not a technical person, but he, he understood the guarantees and the process. And this is some quotes from him. He says, my hope is the court administrators will embrace the possibility of enhancing public oversight while preserving necessary secrecy. And uh, then another thing is lessons learned here will smooth the way toward greater accountability for a broader class of secret information processes. So this is actually an interesting quote. Um, not so much because it, he said it, but there is really uh, more here than just the court system. So there's a notion here of a secret process. So it's not just two people. There's a lot of entities here, the law enforcement, the courts, the companies, you know, the public. So it's much more complicated than just dealing with very clear prover verifier. You know, there's a whole bunch of them. They have different uh, things that we can assume about them in the threat model, and they all has to work uh, consistently. But you can see that the tools that we have can govern this, such a thing. So what we starting to do is to sort of define what we mean by a secret process, you know. And a secret process is some sort of extension of what we think about, let's say, as an interaction between two parties. Uh, and the tools that we have can, can be useful. So now I have probably two minutes, and that's perfect, because I want to talk about the other paper. So this other paper with Sanu was actually appeared before uh, this other paper, and it talked about secret laws. Remember I mentioned in the first slide that there's something called secret laws, okay? So, so far, the laws weren't secret. It's the fact that you actually agreed to grant a surveillance act or not was, was secret. But there is apparently, um, you remember there was, a, I think it was in the days of Bush or something, that there was a, a decision to have, um, so it's on the, on the next slide, so what's a secret law? A, uh, so, tradition, so technically you can't have a law to be secret, secret, but an application of the law actually depends on decision in prior cases and court opinions about how the law should be applied. So those are no laws themselves. And uh, these can be classified. And apparently after 9-11, you know, because of national security threats, uh, you know, there was a whole bunch of cases about foreign uh, sort of uh, surveillance of, uh, of foreign nationals that go under this secret, what people call secret laws. Even it's not the law that's secret, but these type of things are secret. And there was a lot of a big uproar about this, journalists, legal scholars, activists, commenting on uh, this rise of secret law, that it's not, it's not really consistent with what we think about as, as democracy. Um, so a, 
it, okay, so here's some details. It was created in 1978, I guess, apparently, posted in Nixon investigators. And in 2005, the New York Times revealed um, a whole bunch of uh, warrantless domestic wiretapping that were authorized by actually this foreign uh, court. Uh, so what can we do? So I think the answer, again, is obvious to people who understand about zero knowledge. Uh, but this is a nice quote, so I will give it to you. Uh, this is from Kafka in Parables and Paradoxes. He says, our laws are not generally known. They are kept secret by a small group of nobles or rulers. We are convinced that these ancient laws are scrupulously administered. Nevertheless, it's an extremely painful thing to be ruled by laws that one does not know. So actually, if you look up Kafka quotes online, he's got some very good uh, quote is a particular one, and remind me later. Uh, you can add it to the next introduction. Uh, but <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so that's the situation, right? So yes, there are these laws, and we trust everyone, but it's a bit disturbing. So again, zero knowledge comes into can come into uh, to to help us here, right? So this paper appeared before the other one, so we didn't actually build anything. We just uh, talked about what properties are needed. And the property one, two, and five, we already addressed in the other work. But the new properties is that the data, uh, uh, that the law is secret. And that there could be cases where they, because of our national security, they want to sort of delete things in the past. So you can add, again, a zero knowledge component, uh, obviously with these secret laws. Um, so the public audibility, so this is just you know, obvious accountable deletion. Uh, there's some tricks you can do there. Uh, so is there anything else I want to say? How to achieve all this, cryptographic tools. Then there's the scheme. I think it's all obvious, right? Uh, you could see the different slides. Uh, I did want to say one more thing. Compliance. Uh, there's some uh, architecture that's Posted, that's written up. So, just last two remarks. The codifying the law is a complex issue. I think everybody's thinking this. They say that's very nice, you know, but it's not just equality of, you know, no more equality or the fact that there exists something in a set that you are equal to. Now you have to write a law. You have to write all this in code. You have to show consistency. In theory, it's all true, but it's difficult. So we acknowledge that, not solve it. Um, Okay, a, another thing is that the record keeper should lie, and that's what could lie, not should lie. Who said that? <laughs> uh, right, it could lie. And we can't say nothing about that. So I think um, that's true uh, in any kind of record keep keeping system, right? People can lie, and there's nothing we can do about that. You know, that's our kind of base belief. Thank you. <clears throat>